All right. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins and rose again the third day. My name is Brother Ed, and I'd like to welcome you to KJV Bible Scope Monday Night Bible Q&A. Monday Night Bible Q&A. I'm going to do a quick check um, to see if the audio is working. Let's just check that. Yep. It looks like we're, we're pretty good here. Uh, video working, audio working. So uh, we've got a uh, two questions tonight that we're going to attempt to answer. Uh, you guys pray for me that I can give satisfactory answers according to the word of God. And I would like to read you something concerning the beginning of our broadcast as to the content of our broadcast. And that's uh, 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 1. 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 1. Now, I'm going to read this to you, and then we'll just make a few comments here. Uh, and when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions. And she came to Jerusalem with a very great train, with camels that bear spices, and very much gold and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. And Solomon told her all her questions. There was not anything hid from the king, which he told her not. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all Solomon's wisdom and the house that he had built, and the meat of his table, and the sitting of his servants, and the attendance of his ministers, and their apparel, and his cupbearers, and his ascent, by which he went up in, unto the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. How about that? He completely answered all of her hard questions, huh? She proved him with hard questions, and he answered all that was in her heart. And you know what? I am no Solomon. Uh, I am by no means a Solomon. I am not trying to compare myself to Solomon, but I tell you this, this book, this book, the Holy Bible, I'm the King James Bible, by the way, but this Holy book has more knowledge than Solomon. And when you want to get on Brother Ed's Q&A, you know what we're doing? We're appealing to something that's greater than Solomon. We're appealing to the pure wisdom, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Where is Christ's power at? Where is his wisdom at? If you said in the Holy Bible, you're correct. That's where you can find more wisdom than Solomon. And you can find also including in the Bible Solomon's wisdom. But isn't it great to know that we have something that's greater than Solomon's wisdom? It's the Lord Jesus Christ who supplied Solomon with wisdom. <laughs> and so when we're on this broadcast, you know, you know what our a final authority is? It's the Holy Bible. It's the mind of God that's greater than the wisest man that ever lived on the planet. Isn't that great to know that? So now that we know where our authority is, as we're going to do our Bible Q&A tonight, but how about this? How about if you're lost and undone today, do you have the wisdom? Do you have access to the wisdom of God? Do you have access to the means to uh, change your destination from hell to being with the Lord? Do you have the means? Do you have the ability to have access to that information? We do. And us here in America don't have an excuse. We don't, we got access to this information and we take it for granted. And we've got third world countries, fourth, fourth world countries, fifth world countries that don't have access to these things. And what a shame on us that not only do we not care about the deep things of God, having access not only to the gospel, but to all the wisdom of God and more wisdom than Solomon had. And yet, and yet. We not only neglect that knowledge, but we neglect giving that knowledge to others that don't have it. 
What a shame. What a shame that 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 we're like that. What a shame if, if, our, if our attitudes are like that. I'm not saying everybody is, but I think at times we have different temperaments of maybe not caring and, and present party included. We need to constantly keep our minds focused on Jesus and trying to transform our minds to be able to view this world the right way, constantly correcting ourselves every day so we can ma maximize the right conformity to Jesus that we need to live proper Christian lives to glorify and please the Lord Jesus Christ. I think that's so important, okay? And uh, with that being said, if you're not saved today, what are you waiting for? There's nothing to wait for. Because five minutes from now, if you die, what you did with Jesus Christ will, will matter in eternity. You need to believe and trust that Jesus died for your sins and rose again the third day. That is not a magical incantation. That is the facts. That is the knowledge that you need to have. But you've got to go a step further than facts and knowledge. You've got to take that knowledge. You've got to take those facts of the finished cross work of Jesus. And you've got to put your faith and your trust and your desire in believing that finished gospel of Jesus Christ. Great to have the knowledge, great to have the facts, but it doesn't mean anything if that's all you have. You've got to put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, and a transaction will happen that very moment. The Lord Jesus Christ will forgive your sins, and at the same time, you will receive everlasting life. You will be born again. You'll be a new creature in Christ. What a great thing. You'll be born again, my friend. And what a great thing that you can have right there by a free gift of grace and mercy from our Lord Jesus Christ in the purpose of why he died on that old rugged cross. All right, just a little opening there uh, concerning Solomon. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed that because it really does apply practically to what we're talking about and how we're going to be diving into this thing tonight. And believe me, this is going to be a real interesting uh, broadcast tonight uh, concerning missionaries. A little bit of missionary uh, thought going on here, okay? So let's go ahead. Let's, let's go ahead and dive into this. And uh, I know you guys don't see Justin here. And really quick, let me just say a little something about Justin. You guys pray for Justin. Um, Justin took a team of Bible Baptist Church uh, soldiers, amen, and uh, brought this team out to the Trump rally in Sanford this evening. And you guys pray that they're not going over there to partake of the Trump rally what do you think they're doing? They're going down there to preach to the people that are at the Trump rally and the people that are against the Trump rally. And Justin and the team are going to be down there preaching the gospel to offer them something better than a man, somebody better than Trump, somebody better than Biden, somebody that's better than a king, better than a president, the Lord Jesus Christ. King of kings, Lord of lords. Not only was he a man or is a man, but he is God. Amen. So we're going to trust in God manifest in the flesh. And yes, uh, justified, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world and are received up in the glory. Amen. Because only Jesus Christ's sacrifice is acceptable to God. That's why we need to trust in his sacrifice instead of our own sacrifices. All right. So there it is, a little bit of that. Now let's go, let me go ahead and put on the screen the first question here, and it will be from Rick and Linda West. From Rick and Linda West. And here it is. Brother Ed, Brother Dan, King pointed out to us that the word missionary is not in the Bible. However, the word witness is. Why not use the word witness for all Christians in all lands since we are all called to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do you know when the term missionary began to be used for those who go to foreign lands? Thank you for your consideration of these two words, Rick and Linda West. I think that is a very, very, very good question. Very good question. I mean, I'm you know, lately, the questions have been really challenging on here. And I don't mean challenging as we can't answer them, but challenging as it, it you really got to know your stuff here. You can't just be uh, slumping over like a sloth, man. You, you got to know what you believe and why you believe it. And um, I, I'm going to I'm going to throw this out there on the outset. As we talk about the differences between witness, uh, missionary, uh and servant of Christ and so forth. Um, I would say this, 
there's a lot of things in the Christian life and that we use as uh, you know, spiritual words that aren't in the Bible. And I, I would say maybe some things like Sunday school teacher. Um, why have a Sunday school teacher if it's not in the Bible? I, I, I contend when we deal with uh, post-tribulationalists, uh, they'll say that the word rapture is not in the Bible, but yet we use the, the terminology rapture because we're not saying that uh, we're not defending the word, we're defending the teaching. Um, you can go to the word uh, Trinity. I don't particularly uh, use the word dogmatically all the time, the word Trinity. I use the word uh, terminology triunity because it actually describes what I actually believe. Um, but I'm not against the word Trinity, but I know we use it and Trinity is not in the Bible. I'm talking about the word Trinity. The teaching is there. Now, if you're saying Trinity just means three gods, then yeah, I don't believe that. But if you say, well, well, when I say Trinity, I mean three and one, first John five, seven. Okay, I can agree with that. But then when I when we go to the terminology triunity, well, that actually means three and one. <laughs> you see, see, see why I use triunity, but I'm not against Trinity if you just uh define your terms, okay? Define your terminology. So when we deal with missionary, um, here we have a word that you can completely say it's not in the Bible, but yet we can see the work and the proof of what a missionary is and how we define that, the proof of that work in the Bible. Now, uh, before we dive a little deeper into this, I just wanted to open, open up with the, the, these thoughts of having words that we use as Christians all the time that aren't in the Bible, but we know the teachings are there. And, and that only comes from you, you knowing your Bible. <laughs> If you don't know your Bible and somebody's talking about all these words, then obviously you're not going to know. There's going to be some ignorance there, but it's not too late for you. You can learn. Okay, so let's start off talking about evangelists. I, I know we're a little bit off, but not too far. Let's talk about evangelists and look at and we'll look it up in a Noel Webster's 1828. Okay, evangelist. A writer of the history or doctrines, precepts, actions, life, and death of our blessed Savior, Jesus Christ, as the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, question, is Matt, are, or, I don't know the, the right wording here, is or are uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are they evangelists? Are, l l let me ask you another question. Are they witnesses? Let me ask you another question. Are they servants of the Lord? Are they apostles? You see, you would have to answer yes to all of those. So what we need to know is that sometimes we have uh, different words, and now words do mean things, okay? Servant of the Lord means something. Evangelist means something, okay? We have uh, witness means something. But an evangelist, how we define an evangelist, we would say is a church planter. Evangelist is a church planter. Now, is a, an evangelist being a church planter, does, it, does he qualify as a witness? Well, obviously, yes. Well, why don't we just call him a witness? Because we're looking at the specific focus of what this servant of the Lord or what this witness is doing, his purpose in what he's doing when he's out in the mission field. And notice I'm using the word mission field. Or we could just say out in the world, right? He's doing in wor a work of an evangelist by planting churches. So, yeah, I could say, well, Brother Ed's going to go out and witness. But you might not be able to correctly say Brother Ed's going to go out and do some evangelism because I'm not planting any churches. So when you start zooming in on a lot of the definitions of these words, they do have meanings. So is an should an evangelist be a witness? Yes. If you're not witnessing and you want to be an evangelist, then you got a problem. I think maybe some of the qualifications, I don't think I'm pushing this thought too far. I think if some of the qualifications of being an evangelist is you being uh, what people call being on fire for the Lord, uh, going out witnessing, showing by your testimony, your exemplary testimony, that you want to witness to people. You care about people. You want to get people the gospel and more so. You want to start churches so people have a place to go to learn more about Jesus Christ and grow in grace in the Lord. Evangelist. 
So we would use the term evangelist, but the argument, brother Ed, is missionary, right? So let's, uh, uh, I just want to give you a few verses on evangelists. Uh, Acts 21, 8. Acts 21, 8. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip, the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And then 2 Timothy 4, 5. But watch thou in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. So we would say an evangelist, um, I believe an evangelist wears many hats. He's not, he, he does pastoral work, but he's not a pastor. He does deacon work, but he's not a deacon. He does bishop work, but he's not a bishop. He does witnessing work. And yes, he's, he's not exclusively a witness only. So he wears a lot of hats. Okay. So a lot, we got to be careful. Well, he's an evangelist, not a witness. No, well, he's a witness too. That's part of what he is. Okay. Sometimes we, we, we try to just, well, well, somebody's called this specific word here. And then we want to zoom in that word to that person. And that's all he can ever be. Well, remember in the spiritual gifts, uh, there's people that can have one gift, they could have two gifts. And the Bible even says in Corinthians that we ought to desire as many gifts as, as we could get. So we shouldn't be boiled down to one gift. We, we ought to desire all the gifts. All right. Well, a little bit of evangelists. Now, let's talk about apostle because I believe when we talk about missionaries, um, we're going to be, now, 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 mind you, evangelist and apostle is in the Bible. And I believe that when we're talking about evangelist and apostle, uh, we're going to be able to sum up what a missionary is uh, from what an evangelist is and what an apostle is. And it's not going to be exclusively an apostle because we have a qualification to be an apostle. So nobody can be an apostle today. Um, that is something in time past. And I believe that the last apostle uh, is it, it could have been uh, the John, John the Revelator could have could have been the last apostle that ever lived. I I, I don't I don't quote me for certain on that, but I, it it seems like he he could have been the last apostle. So let, let's talk about apostle real quick. Uh, give you No Webster's eighteen twenty eight dictionary definition here: a person deputed to execute some important business, but appropriately a disciple of Christ commissioned to preach the gospel. Twelve persons were selected by Christ for this purpose, and Judas, one of the number, proving an apostate, his place was supplied by Matthias, Acts 1. The title of apostle is applied to Christ himself, Hebrews 3. In the primitive ages of the church, other ministers were called apostles, Romans 16, as were persons sent to carry alms from one church to another, Philippians 2. This title was also given to persons who first planted the Christian faith. Thus, Dionysus of Corinth is called the Apostle of France, and Jesuit missionaries are called apostles. And see, that now we're taking a left. We're, we're, we're getting off of what bi the Bible teaches. Now, I'm not going to read the rest of that because I don't want to, you know, want you guys in error. <laughs> but let's, let's talk a little bit about this. There are, and, and I don't want to go deep into this whole apostle thing because we can spend all night on apostles and never get to missionaries. Um, even though a lot of what apostle is, you know, we can revert to what a missionary is by using descriptives of the apostle. But at the same time, we can really get into a lot of rabbit trails with this. We've in the Bible, I believe there are two types of apostles the original apostles of the lamb, and then those that were deemed apostles by the apostles themselves and the witnesses, as well as Jesus Christ. Um, and, and the reason why I say that is because of Paul, he was born out of due time. So yeah, there, there was a time of apostles and that time ended. Now, the reason why I say that is because you have signs of an apostle and if you're not an apostle, you don't, you couldn't have signs of an apostle. And so I'm going to throw a big word at you just so we can cut it short on the apostles. And maybe you guys can study this out later, or maybe we can do a broadcast on it. Classic cessationism. That is a huge word. I understand, oh, brother, I didn't come on here to get all this, you know, theology. Classic cessational, since classic cessationism 
is the terminology that I would use to describe something that I would have to explain to you about a whole hour to explain it to you that I could just say in two words. Classic cessationism. I'm going to try to do, I'm going to try to lump sum it down really, really fast. The last, the sign gifts of it or the works of an apostle in the sense of the sign gifts, not the works of what they were doing and going through the great commission. Okay. But through the sign gifts, through the signs, wonders, and miracles, when the new Testament was complete, there were no more need for sign gifts of the apostle because the reason why God gave the sign gifts was to confirm the word they were they were preaching to other people. And that would confirm what they were saying was true. It was from God. So the signs, wonders, and miracles were a confirmation. Now, you can go to Mark 16, go to the last verse to prove that. You can go to Hebrews, I think it's uh, 5. Uh, four or five, you can, they, they confirm the word with signs, wonders, and miracles following. So they were a confirmation of the word of God. They weren't to be carried over after the New Testament was completed because then there would be no purpose for the New Testament to be completed if people can do sign gifts today because that means that you're preaching new revelation outside of the word of God, outside of the Holy Bible. And then you're confirming that with signs, wonders, and miracles saying, well, we have more revelation. We need to add more to the Bible. But the Bible gives you the rebuke to add anything or take anything from the word of God. That's Revelation 22, 18 and 19. So the sign gifts died out before the final apostle died. They, the, the sign gifts were already depleting. Paul was already losing a lot of his sign gifts because he couldn't heal. He couldn't heal Trophimus in Miletum. Paul couldn't heal himself when he prayed three times for God to heal him. So the sign gifts started dying out before the apostles completely died out. And because we had a New Testament completed, when a New Testament was completed, no more sign gifts. That's what classic cessationism is. So I try to cover that really briefly. Uh, hopefully you guys understood that. Now, maybe one day we can really go through the verses and I can show you, uh, you know, in the verses um, systematically, and I can show you how the apostles, when they first got the commission and then had the sign gifts and what the sign gifts were for, and then how they started losing the sign gifts close towards the end of their apostleship or the ends of their lives. Okay, so qualifications of an apostle. Where do you find that at? Go to Acts 1. Go to Acts 1. Um, Acts 1 will give you the qualifications of an apostle. So really quickly, I told you I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on apostles, but we do need to know this for our uh, missionary question. Acts 1, and let's go to... Um, go to verse 19, go to verse 19, because here you, you're going to have the switch out of the bishopric of Judas, and it's going to go to Matthias. Now, this is important because we're talking about somebody being an apostle and what the qualifications of being an apostle are. And that would be important for a lot of Pentecostals today and a lot of uh, these holiness movements, uh, because they all claim to be apostles. This would really help them. Now go to verse 19, and it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as the field is called in their proper tongue, Aseldama, that is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. So that was uh, all cross-referencing the book of Psalms right there. Um, we don't have time to go there right now. Wherefore, of these men which have companied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. All right. Verse 21, first qualification. These men which have companied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. Ask yourself the question, have I done that? For a qualification as an apostle, have I companied with the other apostles and I saw Jesus Christ going in and out among us? Was I, am I a witness of that? Come on, I'm not talking about that I read it and I'm witnessing what I read. I'm talking about was I physically there? Well, none of us are that old to have been there today. So that, that already disqualifies us from being an apostle 
in point one of a qualification here in Acts 121. Now, Acts 122, another qualification, beginning from the baptism of John. Okay, so not only from the time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, from the beginning, from the baptism of John. So now we got a time frame. Were you there from the beginning of the baptism of John? Were you there? Do you know John? You shook his hand. Unto the same day that he was taken up from us. Do, do, were you there when Jesus was taken up from you? Did you see him go up into the heavenlies in a cloud? Amazing. You're a really old person. If you want to, if you're claiming to be an apostle today, must now look, must one be ordained? Now, ordained doesn't mean from the foundation of the world like Calvinists believe. Ordained in the Bible means prepared. Must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection? So we need a preparation for a proper witness with us of his resurrection. And the only one that can be qualified to do that is somebody that, that meets these qualifications you see that so we did three qualifications one they had to have accompanied with the apostles when the lord and let's just stop right there accompanied with the apostles that's point one. Point two, when the lord jesus went in and out among us from the beginning of the baptism of john until the same day he was taken from from us and then point three they had to be a witness of a physical witness not Reading the Bible, say, okay, I witnessed that because I read it. No, you had to physically have been there of, and be a witness of his resurrection. Are you that? Do you have those three qualifications? And the answer is no. No, none of us have that. Pentecostals don't have that. Holiness movement doesn't have that. Sabellianists don't have that. Jesus only modalism doesn't have that. Name it. Name any denomination out there. None of them can go can say they're apostles and say they have been there. Nobody can do that. So therefore, everybody that claims to be an apostle today is already disqualified, not because Brother Ed says so, but because the Bible disqualifies them because of the Bible's qualifications. All right. So now that we knocked that out of the ballpark, because I like knocking false doctrine out of the ballpark, um, let's talk a little bit now about these apostles and Paul, who worked the Great Commission, and his ministry was mainly going out to the Gentiles, even though he did preach to Jews. Um, that, that is a hyper-dispensational refute right there, by the way. Um, yeah, G, uh, Paul preached to Jews and Gentiles, but his main ministry was Gentiles. So he went mainly to the Gentiles, okay? So he's doing what? What is he doing? Go to Mark 16, 15. Go to Mark 16, 15. Now, I, I want you to see this. Look very carefully at this. And he said unto them. Now, who's the them? Who's the them in Mark 16, 15? Look at verse 14. Afterward, he appeared unto the what? The 11 as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, which for those of you that believe that, um, the apostles, you know, they're ordained, you know, they're all they can be is holy. They are, they're always acting in faith. Well, Mark 16, 14, um, he, Jesus upbraided them. Upbraiding is not a good thing. Uh, uh, they had unbelief. What is the unbelieving, the abominable murders, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars shall have their part in the lake, which burneth the fire and brimstone. These guys are in unbelief. That's one of the sins in Revelation 21, 8. <laughs> they're in unbelief. And the hardness of heart, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised. Well, these guys were circumcised. They were still stiff-necked. Okay. Well, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So what is Paul doing? Paul's, he's attempting to fill the Great Commission. You go all through the book of Acts. Go, go right when he gets saved in Acts 8. Go Acts 9, Acts 10, Acts 11. You can read all down the line. Go to Timothy, book of, or, or 1st, 2nd Timothy. You read all the way down. Paul's establishing churches at Ephesus, Corinth. I mean, he's going down the line, establishing churches. But what is he, what is he not doing? He's not staying at a single church. He's not staying there and being the pastor of that church, even though he's doing some pastoral work there because he's, 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 he's got many hats on. He, 
He's got many, come on, he's got many jobs going on at one time. Be doing this work. Get ready. Do this work of an apostle. All right. Well, so we, as far as Mark 16, 15, we can do the work of an apostle as well. But we're not giving new revelation as the apostles gave new revelation because they're known as posts, a postal. They're posts, they're foundation. Now, if you go to Ephesians 2.20, I want to show you this. Um, nobody's doing this today because we have a complete Bible. But look at Ephesians 2.20 carefully. Uh, go, back, go back one verse to verse 19. Ephesians 2.19. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So the apostles are foundation, correct? The prophets are foundation, correct? We're talking about prophets giving new revelation that came from God. We're talking about apostles that received new revelation that came from God, that Nobody had any scriptures for because they were being written down when God was giving the apostles those, those revelations. So their foundation, but what's the foundation of their foundation? We just read it. Jesus Christ is their foundation. So the apostles are resting upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. See how that works? Not hard, not hard. So when we get to the work of an apostle, Meaning, we don't have sign gifts of an apostle. We're not establishing new revelations to add to the Bible, to add to the Word of God. That The Word of God is already complete. But what are we doing concerning an apostle? We're doing this work of going into all the world and preaching the gospel to every creature. Now, it's not just doing that, right? It'd be great if, if you did that. I mean, and that's all you did, it'd still be great. But a lot of times with the Great Commission comes even more jobs that we need to do, right? Not only preach the gospel to every creature, but when a creature gets saved and he becomes a new creature, he needs somewhere to go. He needs somewhere to learn the Bible. He needs somewhere to learn how to live as the new creature so he can learn how to conform to, to be conformed to the image of his son, Romans 8, 29, right? He needs to learn that. He's not going to learn that if he don't have a church to go to. So, so not only does Paul or us or other people that are going out to what we call the mission field or uh, other lands, but they're preaching to them and then supplying them with a place to be. Now that all costs money. That all needs to be paid for. Well, the, the person going out there can't pay for it because he's devoting all his time to do it, to being witness to witnessing to all these people. And as he witnesses to all these people and say 30 people get saved or Two people get saved or one person gets saved. And then maybe five months later, another person gets saved. These people ain't got nowhere to go because there's no churches in the area. Well, this guy's going to go there and plan a church. Well, evangelist, doing some work of an evangelist. Well, and what we also call missionary, missionary. Now, reason why we call it missionary, I believe this is my take only. I mean, you can probably uh, learn a lot from others that have really did a lot of research on missionaries, um, maybe some actual missionaries that know all about the history of, of the, the term missionary. But I would say, um, as I'm looking at the Bible and I'm just reading what the Bible says for what it actually says, I would say Mark 16, 15, look at it carefully. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world. That's everywhere, all the world, not a certain locale only, but you're going all over the place and you're preaching the gospel to every creature. Now that's great. Like I said, we want to do that. We want people to be saved by the gospel. But again, uh, we've got a, we've got a Bible that's that thick for a reason. It just not only salvation. So that's why when we talk about Mark 16, 15, and then we, we, we call it the great Get ready. The great commission. Now, what is the predicated thing on the commission? It is the word mission at the end of commission. So people are on a mission to fulfill the 
ordinances or would you say the 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 laws and what God what Jesus Christ told you to do told you to go fulfill that and it's for us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature that is a command for us to do so so we are not giving new again we are not giving new revelation as apostles gave new revelation and confirmed that revelation with signs wonders and miracles we would not call ourselves apostles because we want to go into all the world to preach the gospel to every creature not give them new revelation on different things but we are saved people that are on a mission to do the commission so when you look up the word missionary in the bible uh, Noel webster's 1828 this is what it says one sent to propagate religion christian missionaries are called missionaries of the cross uh pertaining to mission as a missionary meeting a missionary fund uh, what makes a missionary a missionary is taking on the mission of the Great Commission. As Paul being the first apostle, acting on going into all the world and preaching the gospel to every creature, or and, and what he did is he preached to as many as he could, as Paul is testifying to King Agrippa from Acts 26, 1 to 12, we find, uh, for the sake of time, we're not going to have time to read the whole thing. You guys read it on your own time. We find that Paul had authority and commission to persecute the church, it actually says it in there. Uh, you know, you know, let, let's look at it. Let's look at it. Go to Acts 26, and, and just for the sake of time, we're going to have to go down to verse 12. Where, whereupon, as I went to Damascus with, watch, with authority and commission from the chief priests. See that? He had authority, and authority and commission was lined up in the same in the same sentence there, right? In the same verse. And so he had authority and that authority in the commission, he had the authority. You know what we have in Jesus Christ? In our commission, we have authority. So we're just kind of, uh, you know, affirmatively using Acts 26, 1 to 12 to just to show you authority and commission, even though, you know, Paul was, you know, doing it wrong. I mean, he was actually um, persecuting the church instead of, helping anything. Okay. So I'm just showing you uh, the, the terminology authority and commission there. And you also have it in Ezra 836 and they delivered the King's commissions unto the King's lieutenants and the, and to the governors on this side of the side, the river, and they furthered the people and the house of God. So you can see a King giving commission to the King's lieutenants and to the governors. You know what we are? We're Kings and priests unto God. We've got authority. And the, our authority comes from the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he gives us commission, commission. And what are we doing in our commission? Well, we're partaking of the mission to do the Lord's command. We're on, we're on a mission, which makes us missionaries. Oh, come on, in a sense, we're all missionaries. But then the, the terminology missionary goes a step further in where missionaries are actually doing the Great Commission and establishing churches there. So it's kind of like an apostle and a, an evangelist kind of mixed together and they're, they're, they're being missionaries. Okay. So I'm giving you my best rendering of what I believe it is. Okay. So it's not going to be a black and white thing. Okay. I do apologize that sometimes people want black and white. You just show me a verse where it says missionary. I'm, I'm putting all this together. I'm just showing you why we do it. And I, I can see it being really reasonable and why we call them missionaries. So go to 2 Corinthians 5, 18. Um, I'm going to close with a few thoughts here before we get to the next question. I want to hurry up and at least answer the next question as well. So go to 2 Corinthians 5, 18, and I'm going to, I'm going to show you something here. And look at this carefully. And it is a tricky for me. It was really tricky when I, when I read this, I took me years to really understand these few passages from first or second Corinthians five eighteen to 20. And here's what it says. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now here's, if you got, if, if you're not against highlighting in your Bible, here's what I did. Highlight us who hath reconciled us. Highlight the word us. Then highlight at the very end, 
ministry of reconciliation. That's what I highlighted there. I got in blue us and then ministry of reconciliation in green. Now, look at the next verse. To wit. Now, what is wit? Wit is the, the, the subjective form of witness, right? Witness. It's the root word of witness. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. You say, well, isn't it basically saying the same thing as verse 18? It's not. Now, I, I want you to look at this carefully. Uh, let's read verse 20 first. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Now watch this. Now we're talking about missionaries, we're talking about evangelists, we're talking about uh, apostles, and we're talking about this work that that people are doing now in the church, this church age, as we're reaching out. You know, R Romans chapter ten. Uh, how can how can they believe, or how can they? How's that verse go? Um, I'm trying to think of how, how that verse went. It's Romans chapter 10 real quick. Uh, let, let, me, let me just go there. I'll, this is going to be how we're going to line all this up in 2 Corinthians 5. So let me just give you, it's uh, Romans chapter 10. And go to verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Right? Now, when we're talking about missionaries, and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? All over the world, there's people that have not heard. All over the world, if they don't have a preacher, they're not going to hear it. Okay? How shall they preach except they be sent? So we're sending out people, correct? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Okay. Back to 2 Corinthians 5. Remember I had you highlight in 2 Corinthians 5.18, us and ministry of reconciliation? Now go to verse 19, highlight world and word of reconciliation. Now, when you just highlight those things, you already know where I'm going. It's not confusing anymore. Second Corinthians 5, 18 is what is the qualifier. So focus, this is focusing on how we are saved and reconciled and has given us the qualification by giving us the ministry. But we have to be reconciled first. Otherwise, we're not qualified for this ministry of reconciliation. Now, look at verse 19. Remember, I had you highlight world and word of reconciliation. Well, this is focusing on what we are to do with the ministry of reconciliation. And it's to focus on God's desire to reconcile the world through me the means of the word of reconciliation. This is our ministry. You see, not too hard to understand. Once we start really zooming in on these words, they are not hard to understand, which brings us to the maximum truth here of 2 Corinthians 5.20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. Not only are we qualified, but now we have this ministry of reconciliation and we can go into the world and we are in Christ's stead as ambassadors for Christ. Well, the terminology of missionary gets a lot bigger, doesn't it? Not only is he a servant of Christ, not only is he a witness of Christ. Um, come on, we can go down the line. Not only is he an, a, he an evangelist, um, not only is he doing the work of an apostle, but he's also an ambassador for Christ. <laughs> We've got a lot. I, and I contend we got more terminologies than that. I'm just, we're scratching the surface on a lot of these. Um, the, the, the saved, the member of the body of Christ can be termed a lot of different things, but I, I contend that a Christian can't be all of the above. The reason why is because there are certain things that we do that are labeled as these words. If I'm not serving Christ, am I really a servant of Christ? I might be a Christian in a sense. And even though the term Christian has meaning behind it, Christian means Christ-like. And if I'm truly Christ-like, am I not going to be doing the works that Christ wants me to do? And some of those areas would be missionaries. Some of those word, you know, areas would be um, evangelists and all, all these other things. So all these words have their place in the Christian concerning what we we're going to do for the Lord. 
but uh, by no means do we just say everything's interchangeable. I don't think everything's interchangeable. I think there are some things that are specifically used in the Bible that we need to be careful with how we use them. And even though missionary is not in the Bible, certainly we can see the work of a missionary, which would be the work of an apostle. Okay. So that's how I would define that. And again, we have some gifts here in, in 1 Corinthians 12, 28. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Look at Ephesians 4, 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and, and teachers. And so when we look at all these gifts, um, some, some were qualified at the time when they were still apostles. And now after the last apostle died, after the sign gifts died out, well, are all apostles? No, because we don't have apostles today. It's, 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 it doesn't, you have the work of an apostle, but just because you're doing the work of an apostle doesn't make you an apostle. Because remember our qualifications in Acts chapter one, uh, be very careful with that. So I believe missionary, missionary is i believe the teaching is there uh rapture i believe the teaching is there try unity of god i believe the teaching is there um definitely um if you have a different take on why we have missionaries praise the lord i'm not here to argue i mean i'm not here to do a battle with you and wits on you know historical terminologies i'm just here to tell you what i believe concerning the scriptures um and i can see the great commission being th that term mission in the terminology commission that we can be missionaries under that rule and going into all the worlds for specific purposes in preaching the gospel and then establishing churches so they can have what we have today in our churches um a, a, a consistent place to go to glorify god to worship god to learn the bible and to have all the things that we have in our churches today i believe that 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 is uh, uh scriptural i believe that it's it's right with what god wanted us to do right with G what jesus has has qualified us to do from the beginning is to not only witness uh, like i said witnessing is great I mean, if all you're doing is witnessing to people and giving them the gospel so they can get saved, praise the Lord. But I, I, I just don't believe it stops there only as the church. We've got to go on to perfection. And the only way to go on to perfection is to establish churches where people can go in other countries and other locales. So I think that's so important. OK, um, very, very important that we just don't stop with salvation. And, and, and again, a lot of times when I say stuff like that, people say, oh, so you're undermining salvation. I am not. I am not this works based salvation guy. I, I am. I am for by grace through faith only in the finished cross work of Jesus Christ. But we have to understand when we preach the gospel, yes, we stop there right at the gospel for salvation. But remember, that's only for salvation. Then we have to tell them after they're saved the importance of living your life and following Christ. And a lot, a lot of times the first step is water baptism. And then right away you, you preach so much against water baptism that they're, they're thinking it's an abomination to get water baptized after they're saved. <laughs> so we, we got to be very careful when we start talking about, you know, as if you're going to go out as a missionary, you got to be careful not to, to rebuke righteous living for Jesus as some kind of an abomination in the sense that when somebody gets saved, they're like, Oh, I better not live for the, <laughs> better not live for the Lord. <laughs> it can really turn into that because, and, and I'm not saying like, it's, it's a, it's a wicked thing to have a desire to make sure somebody understands salvation. I'm not saying it's a wicked thing, but uh, uh, we got to be very careful. We got to be balanced because remember missionaries, not only are they preaching the gospel, get, trying to get these people saved, but they're trying to get them to understand salvation and then understand that they, they have to go on beyond salvation to live for Jesus Christ. So that's so important. That's what missionaries got a tough job as they're going out doing these things. So 
I, I'm just going to, I'm rooting for a missionary right now. Let me just spend a few uh, seconds here rooting for the missionary. Um, a lot of people are too hard on missionaries. They call them moochinaries because they're mooching all the time. I don't, I think that's so disrespectful to call, you know, missionaries that they cannot have a full-time job where they're going is it, they're not going to be able to. Now there's a lot of missionaries. I'm certain there's a lot of missionaries that go to third world countries and they will work. They will do whatever it takes to make a little bit of money to help out with what they're doing. I understand there's people like that, but what about the missionaries that they are unable because they're not citizens of that country or they're alienated because of their religion. They're alienated because of their belief system. Um, you gotta, you gotta leave room for that. And so, I believe that, you know, deputation, help as many missionaries as you can. Check them out. Make sure you you get the ones that are biblical. Make sure you 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 kind of study up on them. But there's even in that, there's only so much you can really know about some missionaries. And then you're just gonna have to put your faith and you know pray to God that that you're putting your resources in the right missionary. Um I would say, do your homework on them. Look at their testimony. Uh, ask them, uh, can I have, you know, maybe some past um, historical documents of what you've done in the past? Let, you know, give me everything that you've ever done. Let, let, give me some recommendations from some churches that know you, uh, maybe some family members that know you and, and they, uh, you know, friends that know you. And let me find out who you are. Let me find out your testimony. Cause I don't know you, you know, just looking at you five minutes, you know, when you got to the church to speak behind the pulpit and talk about your ministry. And I'm just supposed to go on that. I mean, come on, give me something more, you know, uh, give me your phone number, give me your address. You know, let, let me, give me some personal information about you. Um, you want, you want me to support you and, and, and spend my resources on you. I want to make sure I'm, it's going for the Lord. I want, it's going for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's going for the cause that it's supposed to be going for. So do your homework on that kind of stuff. And, and again, I want to root for the missionaries that are doing right. Praise the Lord for you. If you're, if you're out there, you're, you're preaching the gospel, you're starting churches, you're, you're wearing all of the jobs that, you know, a missionary needs to wear, you know, and you're doing it and you're selflessly out there. You're humble. You've got humility and you're just doing the best you can do with what the resources you have. Praise the Lord for you. And, um, we'll, we'll pray for you. Um, it's, 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 it's a tough thing. You know, um, a lot of these missionaries are doing things that I wouldn't even consider doing. And I just, you know, some, somebody's out there doing this stuff, guys. So we need to pray for our missionaries, Pray that uh, more people will hear the gospel. And there's so many missionaries that are out there that are not preaching the correct gospel. They don't believe in the right Bible. They don't believe in the correct Jesus. And they're out there selflessly doing what we should be doing. It's out there selflessly doing what, what missionaries that, that are struggling for support that we are not supporting. We, 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 we need to let these guys be ambassadors for Christ, sent ones to do the Great Commission and then fulfill the Great Commission by establishing a place where people can go that they have won by the Great Commission. Missionaries. Good thing. Good thing. You want to be a missionary? Praise the Lord for you. Uh, one of the high callings of God right there, an ambassador for Christ. Um, don't look down on missionaries that come to your church and they're legitimate. Support these guys. They need your support. There's not enough people supporting these people. And a lot of these people are living on scraps when they go out to the mission field. Uh, help them out. Help, help them. Be a great thing. All right. So next question here. Next question. Uh, we got a little bit of time left. Let's do it. Dan King, Dan King. Hello, Brother Ed, question for you and or your church. Yeah, I want to defer that to my church. Okay, we're done. <laughs> I'm just kidding. What is your guys' approach on knocking doors now that we have these COVID restrictions? Did I hear Brother James right in that you may offer to wear a mask if the person does not feel comfortable? Our church has pretty much stopped door knocking. It's main method of outreach. Wow. He said it's main method of outreach. Since the start of this so-called pandemic 
and I am looking for advice, counsel on different ways of outreach. I have to admit wearing a mask feels like a barrier from me to the other person. Thanks for all you do. God bless. Amen there, Brother Dan. I appreciate your sincere question. Not an easy one. I would say don't let door knocking be your main method of outreach. Let it be one of many main methods of outreach. <laughs> how, about, how about that for starters? Um, you got to have more methods of outreach. Guys, we've got a lot of methods we can do. We can utilize so many things. You can be creative in this country and come up with some things that can reach people for Jesus Christ. I mean, there's, there's so many things you can do as well. Let me just read a verse, a few verses here. Go to 1 Corinthians 9, 19. 1 Corinthians 9, 19. Let's read a little bit of this here. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law. As under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. See? Uh, we got a law wearing a mask. Well, it's not supposed to be a law. It's not constitutional, but it's their law. So why don't you just put on that mask? <laughs> I'm uncomfortable. But what is my comfort compared to them getting the gospel and actually receiving it because they, they don't see me as an abomination because I'm not wearing a mask? It's just a small price to pay. Come on. We can do it to them that are without law as without law, being not without law to God. See, we still got to be under law to God, um, but under the law to Christ that I might gain them that are without law. We want to reach those outlaws, but we can't be an outlaw to God. Amen. Want to reach the outlaw. Even the outlaws wearing the masks, <laughs> holding up the banks. <laughs> <laughs> Under COVID-19, right. 1 Corinthians 9.22, the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. See that? Uh, just have a heart for these people. And I'm telling you, sometimes a little bit of discomfort can go a long way and win somebody to Jesus Christ. Maybe, maybe you can have a conversation about how uncomfortable comfortable how uncomfortable it is to wear a mask and then bring it bring it right into you know what you know what the definition of hypocrisy is it's it's wearing a mask i don't want to be a hypocrite anymore <laughs> and you just have a conversation about jesus from there like a springboard so i mean a lot of things you can do um I mean, obviously, if somebody's going to violate your right to worship Jesus and, you know, right to pray to Jesus or right to, to have a Bible, I mean, yeah, there, there's some lines you can draw there, but something as small as a mask, I think, I think, you know, this, we could do something here. So look at 1 Corinthians 8, 12, 1 Corinthians 8, 12, just go one chapter back. 1 Corinthians 8, 12. But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. I, I think, you know, doing some things that may be uncomfortable for us that are not against the Bible, not, not against God. I think we can do some things that, that will help uh, win the person in their conscience by what we do. Uh, another cross reference, verse 13, uh, the next verse, and we can also do Proverbs 18, 19. So here, here's what I'd say. We should not be the offense when dealing with people about Christ in anything. We should never be, the offense should never be us. If they are offended by our message of Christ, then we are doing the righteous thing. If there's going to be any offense, you got to let Christ be the offense, but don't present Jesus in such a way that you're making him an offense. No, when you're preaching righteously to people and they're just offended because they hate Christ for no reason at all, you're doing right. See, that's, that's the attitude we need to have. Okay. You can have, uh, not, not, now let's talk about some things that we can do. Uh, gospel postcard ministry. You know what we did in our church? 
if you guys remember the bridge track that we have in our church, it's, it's the bridge. You got all these people crossing on a cross to get to heaven, to get to eternal life. Right. And then you have the city over there on the other side. And a lot of people aren't getting on the cross. They're going right into the pit, right into the pit of hell. And we had that made as a postcard and we are able, we were able to pay for that as a church to the city of Deland, the post office could put that in their mailbox because we paid for it. You say, well, don't, well we can't go to post, you know, uh, post, you know, boxes and put tracks in there. We're not allowed to do that, but you can pay the post office to have these postcards made and let them put it in there. That's legal. You can do that. So that's what we did. And how about that for a ministry? You want some outreach? You, you, you got, if you guys can't do door, you know, door to door, here, here's something that's really good that you can devote some resources to, some money to, um, hanging EOCs with door hangers on doors. Look, if you don't want to go door to door to knock on doors because people are going to freak out because you're not wearing a mask or you are wearing a mask and they're just freaking out because you're too close to their, on their, on their property. I don't know who this guy is. He probably has COVID. He's a threat. You could maybe just do some door hangers, put some door hangers on, go to the next door. They can spray it with some Lysol or spray it with some alcohol. How about this one? Gospel sign holding on a busy street corner. You're not engaged one-on-one -on -one with somebody, but you're still holding the gospel on a sign on a street corner where people passing by can read it. Go on, that that's good to do. Well, we, we don't we don't want to do that. Well, see, then it's not the fact, you know, you don't have ways to reach people. It's the fact you're choosing. You, you know, I always say beggars can't be choosers. And as 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 finite specks of dust that should do anything for Jesus Christ within the means of righteousness and the Holy word of God, we ought to not choose what we want to do. We ought to just do whatever the Lord tells us to do. And if we have these availability, these availabilities and these avenues to, to take, why not take them? Why not take the higher ground? Uh, go to any gathering of any local event, pass tracks and hold gospel signs. If anybody's having any kind of event, no matter what it is, go there to that event because obviously they're gathering together. They're not against gathering together. So you show up with the gospel and gospel track. Hold the internet full of gospel messages. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hey, take turns doing, um, on, you know, on a video at your church. Everybody in your church take turns giving your testimony on a video. Everybody take turns at your church doing a testimony on a video. You could put gospel material all over your vehicle, as Ed, Ed Buffards just said. You could put gospel materials all over your car, magnets, bumper stickers. You could wear a shirt everywhere you go that has Jesus, Jesus saves on, on the back. All these things are testimonies and witnessing in some manner. When you, when, when you buy something, mention the gospel to them as you're leaving. Um, maybe they'll get in a conversation with you. So there's a lot of things we can do. I mean, we are not limited. Even in the midst of COVID-19, we are not limited. We think we're limited. And, and the only time you can be really limited is when you limit yourself. Imagine people in those third world countries. Um, let me say this, not third world countries. Let's say, imagine those people that are living within the means of Islam. Imagine how some of these guys have underground churches in the midst of Islam in, say, Saudi Arabia or uh, Afghanistan or Iran or Iraq. Imagine these people that are functioning and still witnessing with a limited. Now, you want to talk about limits? These guys got limits, and yet they're still functioning. They're still witnessing in the capacity that they can do. So imagine us with a still, we have still more freedoms than these guys do, and we need to get creative. We need to get busy for the Lord. We need to not just let one ministry 
be all we do for the Lord. Well, if we can't do that, we, we can't serve the Lord. Yes, you can. You can serve the Lord in a lot more areas. I'm telling you this, even me, even our church, we can do more for the Lord. People look at our church as if, well, yeah, wow, you know, we can't do all that. You know, the thing is, none of us are doing enough. We've got to get on board with this freedom and this liberty we have in this country and start getting creative and, and within reason, within righteousness, getting people the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to do it. We need to, we need to get on board with this thing. Get creative. Get creative. Look, I can't go door knocking. I can, I can get a PA system in certain areas. Uh, I can go to Sanford. Look, we're, this Friday, we're going to go to Sanford. I'm going to be on a, on, a, on, a, on a little median, and I'm going to bring my PA system with me. I got a little microphone now for the PA system. It's a cordless mic. I'm going to be out there with a loud PA system preaching the gospel to a bunch of Trump supporters and a bunch of BLM because that's where they're all gathering. And you know what I can do? I can just preach the gospel to them and it's going in their ears. You never know. Somebody might be listening and actually receive the gospel or plant a seed there. See that? A lot of things we can do for the Lord, guys. A lot of things. Don't get limited by people that want to be limited. We've got freedom. We've got free. We got enough. This country, we've got freedom. Let's do it. Let's get out there and do it. I want to encourage you. Let's get out there and just listen to this. When ministries start opening up like nursing homes, we'll, we'll go to nursing homes. How about prison ministry? Look, you don't, you could just write to people at the prison. Uh, how about this hospital ICU ministry? How about this? They have good news clubs on Zoom classes now. Well, we can't go to elementary schools. You can go go to Good News Club. Go to their website, the CEF website. They'll tell they'll show you how to start a Good News Club ministry with Zoom classes. Um, uh, you can still right now the universities are opening in some areas of the United States. Some universities are opening up now. You can still you might not be able to preach to a whole group of people, but you can still preach to some people. All right, well. Let me just close out with these with these thoughts here. During the plagues of Egypt, come on, that was that was a whole lot worse than COVID. Plagues of Egypt sent by the Lord. Moses, what did Moses do? Did he hide? Did he put his COVID mask on, stay home, not speak the words of the Lord? You know what you know what Moses did in the midst of those plagues. Moses went to Pharaoh and spoke the words of the Lord to these uncircumcised unbelievers. <laughs> during, during the plague of serpents, remember the plague of serpents when they were murmuring against the Lord in the wilderness? What did Moses do? What did Aaron do? They interceded for them. But you know what they told these unbelievers? They spoke the words of the Lord to the to these unbelievers. They were their own people, Israelites, but they were unbelievers. And he spoke the words to them while all the serpents were biting them. Look and live. Look and live. And what do we do when we preach out on the street? We're telling these people to look and live. How can we contrast those two? We had a plague of serpents. Moses is speaking the words of the Lord. Aaron is speaking. The, they're interceding for the unbelievers. What do we need to be doing today? We have the gospel of Jesus. You need to look and live. You need to intercede for these people by going out. And even if you got to yell out at them, hey, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Hey, they heard it. You're in the gospel, amen. That's what we can do for them. Don't be scared of the plague. Don't be scared of the plague. You have more fear of the Lord than the plague. Who has power to heal? Who has power to give you grace to go through the time of trouble and need when you do get a plague? Look, my hope isn't in this body of finite flesh. My hope is in the Lord. I'm going to have a glorified body one day. Do you know, we put so much stock in this flesh that it makes us fearful to even preach the gospel to the lost. Let's not do that. Let's not do that. Paul in prison, 
prison. Who wants to be in prison? There's diseases in prison. Paul in prison preaching the gospel. Paul at the point of death preaching the gospel. Let's preach the gospel to every creature, as we said about the missionary. Let's just go out there and tell people in our local area, in our sphere of influence, we can reach the people we can reach. We can reach the people we're around. Come on. There's some woman jogging by the house. Hey, excuse me. You know what time it is? Oh, you're in a house. I'm out here jogging. What do you mean? You can go in your house and see what time it is. I just wanted to ask you what time it was because you need to redeem the time because the days are evil. One day you're going to die. I just want to tell you about Jesus and the good news. See, so many things you can do. You know, you know what me and uh, Scott Messenger is on here with me right now. You know, you know what me and Scotty did today? In the midst of COVID, you know what me and Scotty did today, this, a this afternoon? We went to his neighborhood and we passed out EOCs. We passed out Essence of Christianity booklets that were that was written by Brother James. Little bitty booklets put a gospel, there's a gospel track in there and an invite to church. And we had it in these door hanger little baggies. And we hung these on doors going up and down the street. We didn't knock on a door. We just put them on the door, on a door. Uh, there were door hangers, just putting them on the doors. That's it. That's what we did. You know what? You never know if somebody's going to read those. You never know if somebody's going to come out, sit down, say, hmm, what's this? Eh, I ain't got nothing to do. I'm just sitting out here, staying away from the world because I don't want to get COVID. Let me read this. Oh, wow. Jesus Christ, your best choice. Hey, what's this booklet? Oh, wow. What a great booklet. Wow, this really makes sense. I understand Christianity a little bit better. I understand how to get saved. Hmm. Interesting, huh? A lot of things we can do to serve the Lord. You know, I, I think a lot of times we're, we're so small in our thinking that we think that only the pastor can come up with ideas for us to do. And if the pastor don't come up with any ideas, we'll just stay home and watch TV. <laughs> really? Look, if your pastor don't look, if your pastor don't want to do nothing, I'm not knocking down anybody's pastor, but if your pastor don't want to do anything, then you need to get up and serve the Lord. All right. Well, hopefully, hopefully that, that comes across well. I'm not trying to be mean to anybody, but guys, we got to serve the Lord. We got too many people in this country ain't doing hardly anything for Jesus, and 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 they walk around and say how much they love Jesus. As they pass by people and they don't tell them anything about Jesus. I mean, you know when you know when I believe you love the Lord is when you do what he says. Then I then when you tell me you love the Lord, bam, I see it. But you know, a lot of times, a lot of us don't declare we love the Lord. You know why? Because we just want to serve him because we actually love him. We don't need to sit there and talk about it all the time. We're out there serving him. We're out there doing something with the life that Jesus has given us. So I don't, I don't, don't get negative on me now. Okay. I, I'm just, I'm speaking to build you up. If you have a wrong view of that, get on board. You know, we all, any of us can repent. Any of us can change our minds and get right on board with these things. So don't, this is not a rebuke. This is, this is admonition, edification. Um, let's just get right with the Lord. Let's get the right mindset. That's, come on, what, 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 what kind of mindset do you think Paul had? When, when he got to prison, what kind of mindset do you think Paul had? Do you think it's like, oh man, I just need a droop. I just need to slump over and just give up. I'm in prison. What can I do in here? What kind of mindset do we have? I mean, you don't have to be Pastor Knox to be on fire for the Lord. <laughs> you don't have to be Brother Ed to have fire for the Lord. You can be you today. Yes, you. And you can say, look, I'm no Brother Ed. I am no Brother James. But I'm going to do what God told me to do. And I'm going to get out there and give God everything I got. Amen. Amen. I think that's a great thing. I don't, I don't expect any of you to be me. I don't expect any of you to be Brother James. But you know what you can be? You can be a person that has your own identity, your own personality, that, that, want, that says, I'm going to serve God in the capacity that I can do. And you know, and Brother Ed can look into your life and say, wow, I need to be more like her. Wow, I need to be more like him. See, wouldn't that be great? 
be followers of me as I am of Christ. Well, I'm not serving Christ anymore. Don't follow me. Follow Christ. All right, there it is. Hopefully that's helpful there, Dan. Um, um, just trying to do my best to give you an answer there. Um, really looked at it. I think it's a good question. A lot of people struggle in these areas. There's a lot of churches that just shut down. They're not doing anything now. The Some of them won't barely have one ministry that's keeping its head above water. And not, then COVID just shut that down. And now they're not doing anything. Um, a lot of them aren't even going to church. Uh, some of them just fell out of church. So it, it, there's a lot of that going on. And the last thing you want to do is when, you know, the pastor's not having service anymore is to just stop functioning for the Lord. The flesh is waiting for you on the other side. Let's get on board and serving God in the capacity that we can do while all these shutdowns are going on. Let's get busy. Let's get, let's even get more busy than we did when we had all this liberty before COVID even happened. Let's get even get more busy. Let's let the devil get angry at us. Think that'd be a great thing. Let's get more busy for the Lord. It's like, man, brother Ed, I don't even see you anymore, man. I, I didn't see you when when the COVID, before the COVID. Now I don't see you at all anymore. You're serving God like all the time, middle of the night, in the morning, in the afternoon. Come on, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's let's pen pal somebody in the in the in in the in the hospital. Let's pen pal somebody in the prison. Let's let's do something for God. Let's send out postcards. Let's 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 get on board with this thing. All right, so hopefully that's helpful. Don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged. Get encouraged for the Lord. Come on. We still got this life that God has given us and has, has sanctioned for us. Let's use this life to honor and glorify Jesus Christ in every aspect of our lives. And whether you're in a crisis, whether you're in a death of a loved one, whether you're at a funeral, whether you're at, at the hospital, you're, you're just depressed because of, of sicknesses and sicknesses happening on your family. Come on. You can, you can change those things around, change those attitudes around and make it a positive thing for the Lord Jesus Christ because he's there with you every step of the way. Amen. Amen. All right. And I will certainly pray for every single one of you, uh, especially in these hard times. Uh, pray that you guys just stay encouraged. A um, lot of negative negativity going on right now, especially with all this politics going on. A lot of negativity. Let's keep our eyes on the Lord every day. Get in the Bible every day. Get in prayer every day. Pray for your missionaries every day. Uh, you know, be an active part of missionaries that are doing the work of a missionary. Uh, come on, let's do it. Let's do all kinds of things for the Lord that, that we didn't even know we could do. <laughs> and let's get on board with these things. All right. So I'm going to end it there. I do thank you guys for your patience and going through painstakingly with me, all these different ideas and different uh, mindsets, but I just looking to Jesus, even though I'm not giving you a thousand Bible verses, looking to Jesus, trying to take the higher ground. If I don't have a verse, always taking the higher ground for Jesus Christ. When I stand before Jesus, when he looks at me, and he says, you know what? You wore that mask. You were uncomfortable wearing that mask, but you did it because you loved me. You did it because you, you wanted this person to be saved. Wouldn't it be a great thing if Jesus could say that? You know, being uncomfortable, but you're doing it for the Lord because you love, you love the Lord. I think a price is a small, a, a mask is a small price to pay. Um, just like many other things that we would have to do nowadays in this COVID social distancing and all that. Um, small price to pay, small price to pay. God, God's not asking us to do a, a whole world of different things that are going to cause pain to us. Um, I think, I think a lot of these are just very minute, small things. So, all right, I'm going to end it. I'm going to end it. I'm going to keep rambling here, but I thank you guys. Uh, thank you for your prayers for this broadcast. I did want to go out with Justin to the Sanford, you know, thing where they were preaching at the Trump rally, but you know what? I, either way, I'm, I'm fine being here, you know, preaching on here, the word of God, encouraging people to serve God. I don't mind uh, being here. I mean, either way, I would have, if I didn't have Q&A in the Trump rally, I would have went with Justin, but I'm here and and I, I don't regret it. I don't mind being here. Praise the Lord. I was, and you guys pray for Justin that he reaches people for Jesus at that Trump rally. See, there was another thing that he did where all people were gathering together and an opportunity to preach the gospel. So see that even at a Trump rally, you can, you, if a Trump rally near you, go and preach the gospel to those people. That's something to do. All right. I'm going to end it. 
here. Thank you guys for joining me on KJV Bible Scope. One more thing. Um, look on the bottom of your screen. It says, send questions to trust the Lord Jesus at gmail.com. I am out of questions. I don't have any questions for next week. So if any of you, uh, even if you're watching the replay, if you would email me on the email at the bottom of the screen, uh, trust the Lord Jesus at gmail.com and just email me some questions that you would like answered. I will do my best to answer. And if Justin's going to be available, he will do his best to give you a proper answer according to the Bible. And I hope you guys, guys do that. Cause I'm trying to keep this thing going. Um, if there's no questions, there's not really much I can do. Uh, maybe preach a little gospel message on here, but that's about it. But we want people to ask questions because maybe there's a question that somebody else wants to know too. And by you asking it will help somebody else and maybe even provoke other people in getting on the broadcast. And if you guys be so kind to share the broadcast so we can get this broadcast out to more and more people so they can partake of it. I, I do my best to share as much as I can, but I'm just one person. I can't do a whole lot. So our, our people that actually watch are very, very, very few because it's not, I don't pay for advertisements because I don't want to annoy. I, I know I don't like advertisements, so I, so I don't pay for any advertisements. So sharing it is probably the only way that I can get any of this information out. So I just upload it to YouTube. I upload or I have it here on Facebook, but that's all I have. So if you guys share it with people that are following you, maybe more and more people will get a hold of this. I hope you do that. It'll be a blessing. And thank you again for joining me on KJB Bible Scope Monday night. Bible Q&A. My name is Brother Ed, and may the Lord richly bless you guys. Y'all have a great and wonderful evening.